I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, a controversial television miniseries on the FX channel, which purports to tell the true-to-life story of the O.J. Simpson trial. It's called The People v. O.J. Simpson. And the question which the series begs is, how accurate is the FX series? Well, no one's better to speak to the veracity of the series than is a man who was part of what was called the legal dream team that successfully defended O.J. Simpson in what was clearly the most celebrated trial in America, perhaps since the Rosenberg trial, Alan Dershowitz, the renowned legal defense lawyer, the Felix Frankfurter Professor of Law Emeritus at Harvard Law School, and the author of a wonderful book that chronicles the history of Jewish lawyers, beginning with Abraham, aptly entitled The World's First, but certainly not last, Jewish Lawyer. It's available at all Jewish bookstores and on Amazon. And Alan, who is portrayed in the series by actor Evan Handler, is at our JBS phones now to give us the scoop on the miniseries. Alan, thank you so much for joining us once again. Well, thank you so much. So, Alan, in one of the opening episodes of the miniseries, The People v. O.J. Simpson, lo and behold, you are depicted as being brought onto the Dream Team because lead attorney Robert Shapiro wanted to stop you from saying on television that you thought Simpson was, in fact, guilty of the murders of Nicole Simpson and Ron Goldman, and so to sort of keep you quiet, you're brought on to the team. To what extent is that story true, Alan? No, it's not true. I called Bob Shapiro when I saw that, and he absolutely denied it. He said, I was brought on, obviously, for my legal ability and to be the appellate lawyer in case an appeal were needed. I was brought on because when I came onto the case, it was a capital case, and I specialize in death penalty cases. Uh, Bob Shapiro didn't even know where that had come from, uh, the notion that I was brought on to keep me quiet. Um, yes, I did say I thought he was guilty the day after the um, murders were committed. I was on the Today Show, and I said, look, this is a guy who, first of all, I said, you always suspect the husband. And the vast majority of uh, these kinds of murders were done by somebody close to the victim, a husband or a lover. I said, so that's number one. Number two, he had a history of uh, some abuse. So it makes him an obvious suspect, and that I thought perhaps he would plead guilty with an explanation and try to excuse himself on the basis of some abuse excuse that, you know, who knows. That was my view based on the evidence at the time I took the case. And when Bob Shapiro called me and asked me if I would join the defense team, my response was no, I couldn't do it because I had expressed my view that he was guilty. Mm -hmm. And Bob said, well, everybody thinks he's guilty based on what we've now seen. Our job is to look at the evidence in a much more critical way and, and see whether we can raise a plausible defense. And so I agreed to join the defense team, having expressed the view that I thought he was probably guilty. Okay. And, um, but it was not because I was going to be on the media. First of all, one of the main things that Bob wanted me to do when I joined the defense team was get on the media. I was on Larry King a number of times talking about the case, and I never expressed my personal views as to the guilt or innocence okay. of O.J. Simpson. The, uh, the day before the, we are taping together now, Alan, there was an episode on television, and in this scene, you suddenly get an idea for how Johnny Cochran, who was at the time questioning a member of the police department, could raise an issue that would deflect attention and give the jury an alternative view of who may have committed the murder. To what extent is that scene accurate? I did have a television set in my office, and we occasionally, with a group of my students, watched the students who were working with me on the case watched parts of the trial on television. And I did come up with a number of creative ideas. Most of my ideas, though, were about the planted evidence, about the sock that had the blood of O.J. Simpson and the blood of one of the victims. And we were able to prove by science that that sock had been tampered with and that blood had been poured on the sock from test tubes and had not come from the murder scene. How can a television series portray events, especially about real figures like yourself, how can they portray it in such a distorted way? And by the way, did you have to give your permission for them no. to include you in this show? No, 
No, not at all. I have no idea what's coming on. I didn't. I have only <laughs> seen a couple of the episodes. I didn't, I didn't see the episode you referred to, but um, um, no, they they took it out of Jeffrey Tubin's book. Jeffrey's a former student of mine, a very able guy. Um, but a lot of the episodes in the in the story are, are inaccurate. My son pinned it right away after the first episode. The first episode, they have me coming in, and maybe it's the second episode. They have me coming in and saying. Uh, 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 Bob Schreier says, let's order lunch out. And I say, no, no, we're too busy. Let's work through lunch. And my son <laughs> said, Dershowitz, not have lunch? Are you kidding? As soon as he saw that, and he said, Nate Niles was right next door to the deli, I would, of course, order a pastrami sandwich. So uh, uh, we knew it was inaccurate right from okay. the beginning. But how can a television series get away with this? Well, they're not doing anything defamatory. In fact, uh, one thing that upset me very much is that they had a scene in the beginning where Bob Shapiro, Bob Kardashian, O.J. Simpson, and the lie detector person are administering a lie detector test, which he fails. And how does that get on television? I didn't know that. Uh -huh. The only four people in the world who knew that were two lawyers, the lie detector administrator, and O.J. Simpson. Who gave them that information, if it's indeed accurate? Where do they get that information? Where do they get information about a private conversation between O.J. Simpson, who's now in prison, and Johnny Cochran, who's dead, yet they have intimate conversations between the two of them. How do they know about that? Mm -hmm. Whenever you see that kind of thing, as a skeptic, you have to ask yourself, is it made up? Did somebody just construct it out of whole cloth? Or did somebody actually disclose what went on with the lawyer-client meeting? That's, of course, unethical. Yes. I would never, ever disclose what went on between me and one of my clients. I don't yes. even disclose it to my wife, my children. Uh, that's the kind of stuff you go to your grave with. Okay. By the way, I remember, you'll tell me if I'm remembering correctly, I feel I remember vividly how during the trial you often appeared on what was then CNBC's nightly shows, especially with Geraldo Rivera, in which Geraldo would ask you questions about whatever had happened that day. Do you remember that period of time? Yes, I do. I was on with him, and I was also on with a guy named Groden. Yes, Charles Grodin, you were on Art with Charles. Yeah. Right. Now, I remember that for you. I don't remember ever seeing you at the lawyer's table in court. Did you also sit at the lawyer's table? Yes, I did, but only on rare occasion. I was probably in the courtroom between six and ten times. I was there when the glove was tried on. And if you look at the um, you know, uh, AP video of it, you'll see me in the background. I was literally just two or three feet away when O.J. tried on the glove. I argued, I would say, two or three times motions uh, in the court. My job was to preserve appellate issues for review in case he lost. So I would be called into the courtroom in order to make arguments that were designed to protect the record for appeal. But I wasn't there on a regular basis. Okay. You know, in your career, you have been the defense lawyer in a lot of high-profile trials and controversial trials, and you and I have spoken about that on L'Chaim, and, mm -hmm. and how you're committed to this notion that everyone is entitled not only to a defense, but the best defense possible. I assume, in part, that is what motivated you to become part of this, what's called legal dream team. Well, it wasn't a dream team. It was a nightmare team, because the lawyers, <laughs> a lot of the lawyers were just, their own egos were pressing hard to try to get um, more publicity and more advantage. I, I did not enjoy particularly the defense team, but uh, I took the case because it was a capital case, and they were threatening Simpson with the death penalty, and I rarely turned down death penalty cases. And, of course, I'm inspired by Abraham. Uh, Avraham uh, argued with God about the sinners of Saddam. They were not nice people. And Abraham said to God, Yes. Far be it from thee, the, the judge of all the world will not himself do justice. Cursed are thou. Um, so uh, if Abraham can stand up for the sinners of Saddam with God, I can certainly stand up for a man who may be innocent or guilty facing the death penalty in California. Uh so I, it sounds to me like you've only seen a couple of episodes. Maybe your children have seen more. Are you pleased or displeased with the way in which you personally are portrayed in this series? Well, you know, I like Evan Handler, the guy who's playing me, and I don't really care. I, have a small, I had a small role um, in the trial, so I have a small role. 
in the miniseries. Uh, what I'm more concerned about is it doesn't accurately portray the reason we won the case, uh, the tampered evidence and the uh, way the police manufactured a piece of evidence, a sock that had blood on it, which had EDTA. And EDTA is a chemical not found in the human body. It's found in test tubes. It's an anticoagulant. And the way it was poured on the sock left mirror images on all four sides, which couldn't possibly happen unless the sock was laying flat when the blood was poured on it. If it were administered when um, the sock were being worn, it would have only mirror images on two sides and then what's called crystallized transfer images on the other two. So we proved conclusively that um, it was um, uh, a tampered piece of evidence, and the jury said, you know, if one piece of evidence has been tampered with, how can we trust the rest of the evidence? Yes. Now, look, Alan, I know it's really, I, I was going to say tricky, but maybe a better word is inappropriate for you to say here whether you think O.J. committed the murders or not. I'll tell you but, a story, though. Please. So when Vivi is elected prime minister of Israel, he calls me and my wife, we were in Israel, asked us to come by and schmooze with him. So we came by the office and we're schmoozing a little bit. And then he takes me into the private little office on the side. Alan, I have to ask you something very confidential. Nobody can listen. He said, Alan, did O.J. do it? <laughs> and I said, Mr. Prime Minister, does Israel have nuclear weapons? He says, well, Alan, you know I can't tell you that. And I said, Mr. Prime Minister, you know I can't tell you that. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, so, of course, I can never disclose my That's own That's a great... Okay. That. But there okay. is a scene in which Robert Shapiro is depicted. It's the, it's the first defense group meeting by saying some of the effect that he assumes everyone around the table assumes O.J. is innocent. And your character at that moment looks incredulous. Did that actually happen? Well, I would never express my views, even to my own fellow lawyers, about what my feelings were about his innocence or guilt. I would express my views about the evidence, but um, you know, my views about innocence or guilt is something I would keep to myself, even with other lawyers. Okay. So, yeah. the, show, uh, the series also uh, presents a very unflattering piction, a depiction, um, John Travolta playing Robert Chimbipiro, and Robert Shapiro was the original lead attorney, but according to the series, he was something, and I, and I say this quietly, something of a jerk who ran into a buzzsaw with Johnny Cochran, played by Courtney Vance, who basically takes over the defense strategy from the very beginning. Is that true? Well, I can only say uh, that uh, Johnny Cochran did take over the defense strategy. Bob Shapiro is a very good lawyer. A uh, very able guy. Um, there were tensions, obviously, between Shapiro and and Cochran, and between Shapiro and Bailey, even more so. And fortunately, since I was not there every day, there were no tensions with me. I got along with everybody, and um, I got calls from everybody seeking my advice, you know, on legal issues. So I had a very positive role in the in the case, and. I was there as the kind of God forbid lawyer, which is what O.J. called me. God forbid he gets convicted. He wanted me to argue the appeal, and I was going to argue the appeal. Interestingly enough, the verdict came down on Erev Yom Kippur, the day before Yom Kippur, and they had asked me to come to California to be there for the verdict, and I said, no, I was going to be in shul with my family. And uh, the verdict came down, and he was acquitted, and I went to shul that night. And usually, when I go to shul in Cambridge, I'm asked to hold a Torah for Kol Nidre. <laughs> People come over, and they wish me Shana Tova. Nobody said a word to me. Amazing. Not a greeting, not the rabbi, <laughs> nobody. The first time anybody ever looked at me is when they were doing the Oshamnu, Bogadnu. You know, <laughs> I, I counseled evil, uh, and they wanted to see how hard I was hitting my heart when it came to the part for forgive me for counseling evil. So it was an unpleasant experience in my own shul. Did it hurt? <laughs> well, you know, uh, not for me. I have a thick skin, and I've done this before. Everybody would have congratulated me and wished me a Shana Tova if we had lost the case. They would have said, well, you did the right thing. You know, you were a defense attorney. You gave him due process. That's the American way. But we won, and that was shocking to everybody. And, you know, I win a lot, a lot of cases. Uh, and people are appalled when I win. They're so happy when I lose. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm proud of my wins, and I'm going to continue to hope winning um, as long as I can continue to you know, practice law and consult on cases. I, I do a lot of pro bono cases now on behalf of uh, people in the Jewish community. I work with Aleph, which is a great organization run by Chabad, which represents on a pro bono basis people in prison, people like Rubashkin and others. Um, of course, I worked on the Jonathan Pollard case. I do a lot of pro bono work on behalf of Israelis. And um, so I'm, you know, I'm proud of the legal work I've done for now 53 years. Well, 
I know and you know you're a very controversial figure, not only in the world as a whole, but in the Jewish community. But I have said, and I will say this unabashedly, I told you before, you're one of my heroes. I've been watching you long before I ever had the chance to speak to you. And then you came on L'Chaim in 1990, Alan. Wow, we were both long time. much younger. And you were fabulous then. And I think the work you've done is both principled and honest and honorable. And you have done enormous credit first to the law profession of the United States of America and to the Jewish community. You are a an incredible voice in defense of the state of Israel and the Jewish people. It is always an honor to have you on. I still want to call you again, and I want you to talk about two other TV trials. One, I want you to talk about making a murderer, and I also want to talk to you about the uh, Madoff trial, but we'll do that another okay. time. Right now, I thank you so much for all of your time, and I wish you called two v'hatzlecha. We will speak again soon. Oh, thank you so much for your kind words. I really appreciate it. Be well. Alan Dershowitz, Felix Frankfurt, a professor of law emeritus of Harvard Law School, and his latest book chronicles the history of Jewish lawyers, beginning with Abraham, the world's first, but certainly not last, Jewish lawyer. You can find it in Jewish bookstores everywhere. You can also order it through Amazon. As always, my thanks to our director, Sloan Copeland, production coordinator, Serge Goldberg, to the associate director of JBS, Dara Golub, and to the producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. Mm -hmm.